This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. Exodus chapter 16, starting with verse 1. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Aaron, or excuse me, Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Verse 4. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass on the sixth day, they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel, At even, then ye shall, go, ye shall know excuse me, that the Lord hath brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning, then ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we? that we murmur against us. Uh, Exodus 16, we're at verse 8. And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you the evening flesh to eat and the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we, uh, are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. Verse 9. And Moses spake unto Aaron, Say, unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even shall ye eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew, uh, excuse me, and when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as a hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, one to another, it is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them. This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating, an omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man of them uh, which are in his tent. And the children of Israel did so, and gathered some more, some less. And when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. And Moses said, Let no man leave of it till the morning. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses, but some of them left it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth with them. And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating, and when the sun waxed hot, it melted. Verse 22. And it came to pass on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man. And all the ru rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and seethe that which ye will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid up 
laid it up until till the morning, and Moses bade, and it did not stink, neither was there any worm therein. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Six days ye shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. Verse 27. And, and it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place, and let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. And the house of Israel called the name of their of manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it like was like wafers made with honey. Verse thirty two. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commandeth. Fill an omer of it to to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherein I have fed you in the wilderness, when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot, and put an omer full of manna therein, and lay it up before the Lord, to be kept for your generations. And the Lord commanded Moses. So Aaron laid it up before the testimony to keep it. And the children of Israel did eat manna forty years, until they came into the land inhabited. And they did eat manna until they came into the land of the borders, until they came into the border of the land of Canaan. Now an omer is a tenth part of an ephod. Now I read the whole chapter. You're probably familiar with the story. Um, as we go through the lesson, we're going to focus more on the manna than the quail, uh, mostly because the manna is more the focus here than the quail. Oh, thanks, babe. How would you like a handout, Scott? Here you go. <laughs> then you can follow along. Uh, so anyway, let's jump right in here. So just before this, what event had happened right at the end of chapter 15? Okay, yeah, they needed water at Mara, and they complained. That the Lord gave them water. Um, this did not make it in the handout, but um, I was reading a journal article this week regarding these, this incident and the one to follow. And of all the times in Scripture the children of Israel sinned, these three events are three times we don't see God acting and judging and punishing his people. Do you ever take note of that? The law has not yet been given at Mount Sinai. After the law is given at Mount Sinai, when the people complain there, like in Numbers 22, God brings serpents and snakes in different times. There's judgment involved. So there's um, these three stories can be viewed or seen in, in a, through a lens of God is teaching and training his people here. He, they, they haven't got full disclosure yet. You know, they haven't fully... Um, the, the law has not been given at Mount Sinai. They don't fully understand everything that's going on. Uh, but he's teaching them. He's testing them. He's trying them. So they didn't do so well at the waters of Merah. Now here, bread from heaven. They're, first part of this in, in verse 1, they're moving uh, from Elam into the wilderness of Sin. Uh, again, I didn't put the place map placings here because really what drives everybody's speculation of what these different places are is where they think Mount Sinai are, is then directs what they, it's kind of circular reasoning. So whatever you think Mount Sinai is, you tend to place these places along that route. There's a lot of discussion there and we'll just let that lie. Um, but the people complain. Uh, in verses two to three, they say it would have been better to die in Egypt. That's a pretty audacious claim. Uh, one we have actually heard before. Uh, they remember Egypt with fondness and the food that they had there. Um, and I don't know any time in history where slaves or oppressed people were the best fed. Uh, you know, I mean, the descriptions they seem to think. Um, but there is, a, there is a lesson, I think, here, because often it's easy to look back at the past as the good old days. And that's not always true. Uh, and I mean, there's, there's those today who are looking to future and technology as that's the, the pinnacle of the good old days. But we look through history with the lens we choose. And if it's a rose-colored lens, we're going to filter out all the pain and suffering. And if it's a, if it's a dark-colored lens, then we're going to see nothing but pain and suffering. 
Um, and so they're looking back to a time of bondage and they're looking back fondly. And I can't imagine how God looks at that. I mean, here they're crying out to him in Egypt and they're being persecuted by Pharaoh. And now that they're out, they're looking back like that was good. Yeah. Yeah, they're very short-sighted in in their desires and their complaint. Uh, I like what um, Philip Graham Ryken says. He says our complaints really are never caused by our outward circumstances. Instead, they reveal the inward condition of our hearts. So the fact that they were hungry wasn't that revealed the heart condition. Does that make sense? The fact that there was pressure, the fact that things weren't going well, it revealed what was in the heart. It didn't make it come out. It didn't make them dissatisfied. It made them, it made them reveal what was wrong in their heart. Uh, whereas with the bitterness before, with the, the water at Mara, there was a bitterness in their heart. Here again, they're complaining. And who do they take this complaint out on? Moses and Aaron. Here again, they, uh, again, these two are the representatives of God. They are speaking on God's behalf. Uh, and again, this plays into the whole, Moses was called to go, but then after Moses rejects and rejects and says, no, I can't, makes excuses, and then God destroys all the excuses, then he finally says, well, I just don't want to do it, basically. Then Aaron comes on the scene, almost as a divine concession, like, fine, if you're not going to do it, I'll send Aaron along. So here we have... Throughout the narrative, sometimes it's Moses, sometimes it's Moses and Aaron. Um, there's kind of a back and forth here. Here, Moses and Aaron are, are uh, lumped in together. God, in verses 4 to 5, provides, um, he's in, in the middle of them complaining, he's going to provide for his people. Verse 4 reads, Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass on the sixth day, they shall repair, prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. I want to emphasize a point here, and I'm going to probably come back to it two or three times in the lesson. But a crucial point here is what do the children of Israel believe about God? Now through the story, what should they believe about God right now? Okay, they should believe he's faithful. He'll provide. He'll deliver. Is there any God too powerful than him? No, it, he, has, he has thwarted the gods of the, the Egyptians. Um, I, I was listening to some material on this, and uh, from an Egyptian perspective, God has just trounced all over all of their gods. And now even as they go out into the wilderness, the Egyptians looked at the wilderness and they, they called it the, like the region of the gods. And so God's going out there. The God of the Hebrews is going out there. And he doesn't need permission from any of these other gods. These other lesser beings, these demonic forces, whatever they are. He doesn't need permission. He's going to trounce wherever he wants to trounce. It's all his anyway. He's the creator God, the ruler over all the world. And so he doesn't need permission from Ra. He doesn't need permission from any of these Egyptian deities. He does what he wants to do when he wants to do it and how he wants to do it. And he's trounced all over them. The children of Israel have came through the Red Sea. God has worked on their behalf. What do they believe about God? And multiple times here we're finding this accusation that he can't provide. Now, isn't that just a stark contrast of like, wait, you were in Egypt, all the plagues, and you're, you're worried about God. He can't provide. He can't take care of you. He can't sustain you. He's going to bring you out to kill you. Okay, so there's a, there's a thought process, of, and it's very dangerous. If we don't believe the right things about God, we'll find ourselves in the same position of complaining and murmuring and 
turning our back on the Lord time and time and time again. Here you go, Dennis. So, uh, moving on here, th- this test of... Uh, oh, did I... Yeah. That's a very helpful point to this discussion. Be- and the reason I say that is, how did the ancient Near Eastern view- people view their gods and their idols? They viewed them as we... <sighs> There's a lot going into this, and if I can articulate it well, I'll be doing great. So their gods were something that they harnessed. They wanted to control it because they had, you you had to to bring it to a level of control. They would perform a ceremony like called the opening of the mouth, where they would literally call for for a demon or deity to to come to their idol, whatever, inhabit it. And the, the idol became the location you could go to to interact with the deity, and you could conjure it because... I mean, this is, it sounds weird to us, but like even the feeding of offerings to idols, and they believe that we have to sustain them. And there's a lot going on in the ancient Near Eastern thinking, but the idolatry system and the gods system, you were manipulating and conjuring, you, you were doing what you could to persuade these gods to actually care and do things on your behalf. We see a little bit of, of Israel even taking that approach. They're expecting God as their to take care of them, um, and yet God's wanting to do more than that, and they're complaining. And that's part of the, the logic of idolatry and why God forbids it is, no, you're not going to house me in some sort of statue. You're not going to control me. You're not going to have puppet strings over me. I am God. I rule. There's none beside me. So there's a stark difference between how the Egyptians and Mesopotamians viewed their God and how the God of the Bible pictures himself. Uh, And there's a lot of discussion that can be behind that, but that's kind of uh, in a nutshell. Does that make some sense in how there's a big difference in how the God of the Bible is portraying himself as compared to uh, the gods of the nations around them? His uh, Jehovah or Yahweh was much more concerned with a relationship than anything else. And um, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right. And then the problem the interesting thing with Aaron though is he goes through the narrative he comes on the scene. He becomes the high priest. He f- fits that role. Who's the one who initiates the golden calf worship? Who's the one who has two sons who completely defy what God says and go in the temple? You know, so, and who's the one who com- then complains about Moses? You know, so Aaron becomes a thorn in his side. And so I, I, w- I would not conclusively say that Aaron was, was not supposed to be in this plan at all. But it, it, it's, it's interesting that Moses' complaint leads to Aaron getting involved. And Aaron, throughout the story, he's not your glamoring, wonderful, <laughs> you know. And, and so it's, uh, there's points of the story you just stop and ponder and consider it and, and don't push it too hard, you know. But just enjoy that and, and just stop and look through Aaron. <sighs> but yet, don't we do the same? You know, so... Um, God's asking them through here, through their complaining. He uses the phrase that he's going to prove them. And so they're being tested in their faith. Are they going to trust God and are they going to obey? Um, If you say you have faith, but you're not going to actually follow up with obedience, it's not really truly faith. So would they depend now on God for the daily food or would they hoard it up? Would they depend and follow the rule here for 
uh, collecting twice before the Sabbath, collecting double the amount, or would they neglect that? And that's really kind of the test here that's happening. Um, and when, I, when we say test, a uh, few New Testament passages might use the term tempt. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good, reasonable English translation. But, but when I say the word tempt, is that ever in a good sense? You would never say in English, you wouldn't say, I'm tempting someone to be nice today. The, 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 tempt is always associated with doing what? Wrong or evil. Okay. Now, to test, every day in school, well, maybe not every day, I guess between the, country, the whole country, somewhere in school, somebody's getting a test every day, right? And what is a test? It's an assessment to see, okay, we've covered this unit in history, and I'm going to give you a test to see what you have actually learned out of the class. Were you doing the homework or were you playing video games the whole time? Were you <laughs> studying the material or were you ignoring it? And the test reveals what? It reveals what you know or what's inside. Okay, And it's a way for teachers and uh, administrators and, and, and people, it's a way for them to gauge and know what you do or don't know. Test is a better way to think about these stories than tempting. Because they're being tested. And their test is, what do you believe? What do you think about this God who, who has redeemed you, brought you through the Red Sea, brought you out of Egypt? What do you think and believe about him? And ultimately, what, ha what are the people exposed to? Or not to. Their hearts are exposed that they're not fully trusting him. They've seen him at work. They've seen him work on their behalf, but every time something happens, they fail to trust him. There's a bit of this that's looking back in how this provision with the six days uh, and rest on the seventh, it's looking back to the creation week, but also looking forward to the fourth commandment uh, coming in the Ten Commandments. Uh, Douglas Stewart notes, he says, the rule looks both forward and backward in testing Israel's faith, in God's provision. It looks backward to the creation account, which specifies that God himself rested on the seventh day. It looks forward to the revelation of the fourth commandment, establishing Sabbath observant as part of, a weekly, of the weekly covenant. The resulting arrangement provided a weekly opportunity for the emerging Israelite community to be tested by God and to learn about his faithful provision. The first time this happens, had the people seen anything like this before? Had they seen manna come down from heaven? The first day it happens, and they go out and they gather all hordes, some of them gather hordes of it and try to save it, okay? Then they see it the next day, and the next day, and the next day. What happens as you see something over and over? Yeah, it becomes more natural to believe, does it not? So after six days of seeing this manna come, or how many days it was till the next Sabbath day, then comes a change in the pattern. Then comes the, okay, there's going to be double this day, and then none. Now, we know from the stories we read it, some of them, what did they do? They didn't gather and lay up. And what happens? They go out on the Sabbath looking for bread, manna, and it's not there. Um, now, think of it in this way. Week after week after week of doing this. Would it become natural? Is it still faith? Okay, I would argue, yes, it's still faith, but the faith has transferred from what you might call a clinging faith to a resting faith. <laughs> what do I mean? Um, you put a kid on a horse who's scared, and they are clinging to that saddle and they are clinging to those reins, and they are clinging to that animal because they're afraid. Are they, are they exercising faith in the horse? Well, to some degree. I mean, they're on the thing, but they're clinging the whole way. But as time goes on, they get comfortable, they get accustomed, they know what a horse can do, they can trust and, and lean and rest on that horse. Does that, does that make sense? And so Israel here, there was a process 
at the beginning, this was hard. This was a big step of faith. This was, what is going to happen? How is God going to provide? What's this going to be like? What do we do? Uh, is, is this going to happen tomorrow? Yes, God said it, but are they going to believe it? Um, and then the end of the week. But as this goes on week by week by week, imagine if you're a young child born into this. Let's say you were born um, after Mount Sinai and the man is coming from heaven. And just from the time you're born, this is what you always see and expect. It would become so natural. You would trust it. You would rest on it. In the same way, all of you right now are resting on chairs, and you don't even really think about it. None of you analyzed your chair today before you sat down to see if it was strong enough to hold you. At least I assume none of you did, right? But you're all having faith in those chairs to hold you up. This is Israel was going to be tested in their faith, and truly, when something is new, it's always more difficult for us to trust. That's when we see our own unbelief, is when it's something out of the box of normal. Does that, does that make sense? And so um, our lives are, are the same way. It may not be manna from heaven. It may be something else. Uh, but when we're tested outside of what's normal, uh, that can create us very, make us very uncomfortable. Um, Moses and Aaron then prophesy or speak on God's behalf. I don't mean prophesy in the sense of they're telling the future, although in a sense they are telling Israel what God's going to do. Um, but uh, they say God's, God's the one who's brought you out of Egypt, verse 6. They clarify, say, your complaint is not really against us, it's against God. Remember, they're the spokesman for God. They're speaking on his behalf. Uh, again, we mentioned this last week, but... You, the people could not look to Moses and Aaron and say, you brought us here. They did say that, but what really had led them to where they were? Was it Moses with his map and navigation system? It was a pillar of fire and cloud. It was the glory cloud moving and leading them. So then the scapegoat becomes Moses and Aaron. Um, and so uh, also here, God will give them food here despite their murmuring. Uh, I'm not sure how much to look at this, but verse 10, it's the people, they see the glory cloud, but it's Moses and Aaron who hear the complaining of the people. They hear that God will send manna in the morning. They hear from God that he will send quail in the evening, which was a, a, like a small bird. I'm not sure if it's the same as the quail we have here, um, but they're hearing from God. But do the people see something? Do the people see the glory cloud? Yeah. So I don't know if Moses and Aaron are off seeing that, uh, but there is then that pattern that's already developed in Scripture um, where Eve sees the fruit, she desires it, she takes it. Abraham saw Hagar. And so Abraham and Sarah saw Hagar. They desired the child. They took it, that her, and, and then we have disaster. Well, there's this pattern of seeing, and not that every time you see something that's evil, but I, I wonder if there's, there's that connection here looking into this text, because the people see the glory cow, what do they want? They're wanting food, but how do they want to get it? Let's complain. Let's murmur. Let's attack Moses and Aaron. Let's... Blame shift, you know. Whereas on on contrast, Moses and Aaron, they're listening to God. They're hearing from him. They're responding to what he says and passing that along to the people. Um, within this passage also, there's um, the phrase evening and morning get repeated several times. Verse 6, at even you shall know that the Lord hath brought you out. Verse 7, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> Verse 12, at even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread. Verse 13, in the evening the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. Is there another passage in the Bible that uses those words a lot? Genesis, creation. What connections would there be between the creation narrative and this? Okay. Okay, good. So God, in, in Genesis, he's creating the whole universe, and he uses that, the, 
the phrasing or the literary structure in that evening and morning were the first day, and evening and morning, evening and morning. And, and the, Moses, as he's writing this, he's picking up a little bit of that evening and morning language and motif, and now what is God creating? Well, yes, he's doing the manna, but he's also, this is the process of birthing or creating a new nation and a new people. So God, in creation, it was a creative work, and he's making the world. Now it's a creative work, and he's making his people. It's a create, so, so there's a sense of this story. It's hearkening back and, and springing back to the new creation of the world. Now this is a new thing, a new creation God's doing. Um, and it's just one of those little touch points uh, where these chapters are, are overlapping a bit. Yes, yeah, um, and s yes, so anyway, I, I like those little nuggets because you begin to see how the scripture overlays on top of the scripture, and as you see these patterns, you start to see, oh, this is kind of cool because it makes bells go off in your head, or it should, okay, and, and if, if they're not, that's okay, it's, it's very dense, so keep reading, all right, and keep reading and reading and reading. Um, and I'm looking at the handout, and I'm looking at the time. I better just ask for questions and call it quits. Comments or questions here at this point? Yeah. We get comfortable in our circumstances, don't we? Even in Egypt as slaves, there's, I'm not saying that was comfortable, but it was familiar. They knew what to expect. Now what's happened is they're out of familiar territory. Uh, at times in our life, we have all found ourselves in unfamiliar territory. Maybe an unfamiliar place, maybe a new setting or surrounding new college, new high school, new, you know, new job, where you don't know anybody or anything. And that's always a little bit, well, for some more than others, unnerving. You're learning the ropes and you're, you're trying to, un you're, you're not wanting to make waves, you're not wanting to get in the way. Um, God's people are in the middle of that. Think of that emotionally, that's how they're, they're this is all new to them. But what it's doing is, as they're in this uncomfortable setting and it's unfamiliar, it's exposing their heart. It's exposing that the God who delivered them, they're not trusting. And in a sense, it's also exposing the hardness of Pharaoh's heart wasn't just Pharaoh. There's a hardness of God's people's heart. And this becomes a pattern through Scripture. And it's a pattern that is only broken at the cross with Christ. So... Anyway, that probably wraps that up. Any other comments or questions this morning? Well, with that, we'll close in a word of prayer and pick up page four next week. Lord, we thank you for your word. And uh, Lord, the lesson for us that how we view and think about you matters. It will come out in what we say and how we think. It'll come out in how, what we do. And Lord, we ask that you would encourage us in our faith, would be, be a people who trust you, trust you in the familiar ways where we've seen you work before, but also be willing to step out and trust you in the new settings and the new circumstances and the new trials that for us we've never faced before. Would our faith in you and our knowledge that you are the God who controls all things settle us and ground us would we as believers not be unbelieving like the Israelites? We ask this in your son's name. Amen. <laughs>